Hey, welcome to Speechless. We're glad to have you here today and this Thursday night live from the SCC studios in White Bear Lake. Also showing live out of St. Paul, SPNN. And uh, today's show, we got some uh, coverage from the Minnesota legislature on a couple family law bills that I think are very positive, going in the right direction. We'll hear some testimony. Uh, and actually, for the first time that I know of, a father's rights group showed up. Um, there's been other groups that have been accused of being father's rights groups that weren't. Uh, they were parental rights group. But this time, uh, father's rights groups with father's rights in their name showed up to testify on these things. Uh, did a very good job. Uh, so we're going to show some of that. Also, and there's two particular bills, but there's a series of 14 bills going on. We'll hear a little bit about that. Uh, when we get to it. <clears throat> uh, also, uh, Common Core uh, is a national standards curriculum, and I went and filmed an event last Friday night at Grace Church Eden Prairie where a professor of um, English from University of Wisconsin Oshkosh, Dr. Pesta, uh, gave a talk about what it was about. We're going to show clips from that, too. Uh, very informative um, people you got to watch this you got to hear what he has to say because this is dangerous stuff and I'll explain why it's dangerous he will too but I'll add my own personal opinion into it and anytime you hear national standards run run fight destroy get rid of anything national uh, because when you do that you give up your liberties so I think you're going to find it a very uh, informative information that you're going to get. Name the names, name the players, where the money's coming from, who benefits, who doesn't, and why the alignments uh, are on this issue from the far right to the extreme left, the socialists, why they're joining together to fight Common Core, and basically they're fighting the uh, establishment Republicans and the big corporate Democrats. Uh, and so it's an interesting uh, pairing that's going on. So we're going to see some of that. But we're going to start out today with is a Minnesota U.S. Supreme Court decision. I just found out about it today. Um, and so I haven't read through the whole thing. I, what I usually do is I start with the dissent. Uh, I, you know, I read the top page and if I don't like what the top page says you know then I go read the dissent first that's just what I do and I started reading it and first of all the first thing I noticed when when I see the two dissenters to this uh, what what the bill what the uh, opinion was about was searches on DUI cases with um, taking and forcing bodily fluids out, and if a person doesn't comply, you know, are they under, is it an improper search uh, if they resist and they take the uh, body fluids anyway? So I can be more specific. Uh, I'm not going to. I think the key thing here is when I looked at the dissenter, I go on, wow, there's something going on here. When I saw Justice Page's name, who I think has ruled correctly on all the family law bills uh, that have, not bills, but orders that have come to the courts. He's been in the minority on those. And then Justice Ross, I go, okay, there's something serious going on here because these two are the two that I think are more of the constitutional experts uh, up on the Minnesota Supreme Court. But when I read the dissent, I'm just kind of going, oh my goodness. Uh, th this is strong, strong, mm. strong language <laughs> about uh, how the uh, majority in this case ruled, uh, which again would be a mixture of Democrats and Republicans uh, as well as on the dissent. You got one Republican appointed judge and one judge that was elected by the people, not appointed by any governor. Uh, so here's the dissent. I hope you can read that there. This is the opening paragraph. 
and Justice Page and Strauss dissent, dissenting jointly. They agreed on this. We respectfully dissent. That sounds nice. It goes downhill. I, I can't say it goes downhill. It gets stronger from there. The court apparently wishes that we lived in a world without Missouri versus McNeely and one in which there are no limits to the search incident to arrest doctrine. But we do not live in such a world. The Supreme Court of the United States has decided McNeely and over the past several decades has limited searches incident to arrest. Even though the court's opinion strikes a confident tone, the truth of the matter is that its decision is born of obstinance. <laughs> not law. Born of obstinance, not law. The court today fundamentally departs from long-standing Fourth Amendment principles and nullifies the warrant requirement in nearly every drunk driving case. Now, in their opinion, they're saying here that uh, you have, basically they're throwing out the Fourth Amendment in drunk driving cases, that they can search you without a warrant, uh, the search doesn't have to be related to the particular um, crime that you're being arrested for. They can just search for anything willy-nilly. And uh, so actually the wording gets even stronger and uh, we won't, I'm just going to read it uh, uh, instead of uh, uh, show it to you. Let's see if I could find it again here. Here we go. Um, oh, things got mixed around. Okay. And then they begin after that paragraph. They say, as justices of a state Supreme Court, we are bound to follow decisions of the Supreme Court of the United States on questions of federal law. Okay. U.S. Constitution Article 6. Rather than carrying out its duty, the court selectively quotes from some Supreme Court decisions and ignores others to reach a decision that is at odds with the Supreme Court precedent on the scope of searches incident to arrest. Two erroneous assumptions permeate the court's analysis. First, the court assumes without support that biological material may be taken from inside a person's body as part of a search incident to arrest. Second, the court assumes again without support that the rationales underlying the search, to incident, search incident to arrest exception, after their safety and preventing destruction of evidence, do not apply to searches of a person. In the end, the court ultimately, ultimately arrives at a decision that is as notable for its disregard of Supreme Court president as it is for defective logic. Oh my goodness. <laughs> this is just, here's what I think is going on. Now, mind you, I haven't read uh, five pages of this order, okay? But here's what's going on in the bottom line of this. They're going out there and they're saying, hey, folks, uh, U.S. Supreme Court, whew, this is a big deal. We are screaming. We are angry. I, I don't know if they are, but we're, we're trying to get your attention here, <laughs> you know. Well, look at this. Hey, this is really uh, illogical, defective logic, total disregard for Supreme Court's orders. You need to hear this, because after this decision, this individual in this case needs to take it to the United States Supreme Court, and the United States Supreme Court needs to hear this. It, it has to be other, overturned. Um, so if, if this defendant doesn't take it to the Supreme Court, it, it ends up being the law of Minnesota, and because of case law, the court's opinion in this, and somebody else is going to have to bring it up, and, and they'll keep arresting people without Fourth Amendment rights. They've basically taken away all the rights to, you know, to be, have your privacy. And, you know, um, 
I got to do a lot more study on this, but that's the that's the basic thing that I hear coming out of this dissent. United States Supreme Court, please, please, we beg you, take a look at this. Now, the other issue is that uh, in the appellate courts today, Michelle McDonald uh, had an appeal on a probable cause hearing for being arrested for driving after under the influence. Now, Michelle McDonald was a candidate, Republican endorsed candidate for the Minnesota Supreme Court. And if you watch the film and the arrest on this show that's only been shown here, uh, you would have noticed that something was really fishy with this officer. Uh, lying, uh, admitted lying, not only the officer but the sergeant. And they just go and um, you know, and then the uh, Hennepin County District Judge, former state representative Abrams, uh, said that uh, they had probable cause, but he, in my opinion, violated a lot of the, what constitutes probable cause. So it, it was interesting. And she ended up being not guilty of uh, driving under the influence. So there's a lot of court cases going on and I think they're they're coming to a head because of we have this um, mentality going on in our police our police uh, forces that they really could pretty much do about whatever they want and they're basically challenging you to take them to court and the problem is yeah, and I've seen in a lot of court cases, these people don't, people don't know what happened to them. They don't know that their rights have been violated. They don't know what to do. I'm also uh, been um, following another man who's been on the show, Don Mashek, who's falsely accused of disorderly conduct in and outside of a courtroom. And what, what they do is they hassle you by the arrest, and then they do all their procedures to protract this as long as possible. And, and so it, even though you did nothing wrong, they want to punish you, so they do this false arrest and then hope you don't defend it or hope you plead. And then they get, you get a public defender who says, I'm not going to defend you. You know, uh, unbelievable. So you see this happening in the courts, and um, you see this happening with the police officers these days that are just being really, really picky, the bad ones. There are a lot of good police officers out there. Um, but the prosecutors, the public defenders, the judges, because they're government officials, the police officers, because they're all governor, government officials, they protect themselves. And, and they have a right to protect themselves, but they do it when they know one of their own has messed up. And that's not right. Uh, it, but that's what's happening. Okay, hey, uh, before we go on to the next uh, issue, which is the Common Core information and videos, I want to remind you this is a live show. You can call in with your comments or questions, 651-747-3838. Also, if you want to watch past episodes, you go to youtube.com, speechlessmn. Uh, also, um, if you just want to send an email, got some suggestions for the show, appreciate those that I get, working on those, uh, speechlessmn at gmail.com. Uh, would love to hear from you. Um, oh, also, um, you can go to... Uh, I'm sorry, what, what did you put up? Uh, M.N. CD4 Conservative. And was that where you watched the video of the McDonald's arrest? Well, you can go to the YouTube and watch the video of McDonald's arrest, too. Uh, but M.N. CD4 Conservative, uh, you will be able to go there soon and watch the Common Core presentation. Um, so, and then go to Speechless MN at, on YouTube for the McDonald uh, case. So, um, past resources, a lot of information there, a lot of breaking news that you don't get anyplace else. Okay, Common Core. Um, it's a national curriculum. 
That's really all I need to tell you. If, if you hear that, you should run. Can you think of any other places that have national curriculums? You know, North Korea, China, um, how about Germany? You know, and here's the scary part to me on a national curriculum. When you set up a national curriculum, you have your people in place to teach it. These are enforcers of the law. And we're going to be talking about data mining, getting information from the kids to really find out information that's about the parents. It ends up with this national education. You get the system, you flip the switch. We turned from a, a, a democratic republic to a, um, a, uh, a Nazi Germany. You know, that's the process that's taking place now. And it's going to limit your free speech. It's going to limit the right to raise your children in your beliefs and educate them with your education and your values. Um, and, uh, but here, it, uh, we're going to get, I'm going to show you a video and we'll comment on that because I think this one big thing here about creativity is, is very, very important. So let's uh, watch what Dr. Pasta has to say. He's an uh, English teacher from the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh written many books, is expert in Shakespeare. Uh, I think you'll find it very interesting what he has to say. This woman is a avowed Marxist. And she's telling you the state is overstepping its bounds. What does that suggest to you? You think she's likely to overstate or understate the problem, right? How about this quote? Common Core eliminates creativity in the classroom and it impedes collaboration. We have teachers here, right? You tell me if I'm wrong, ladies and gentlemen. Aren't there times when you have to throw the curriculum aside? You have to throw the textbook away? Aren't there times where you got 25 kids staring at you with deer in the headlight looks, not getting anything? The best teachers are the ones who have the freedom to create, to be creative, to be able to do what they need to do because not all, not all your kids are the same kid. Who thought it was a good idea to have one standard for 60 million kids? You've got one standard for 60 million kids. By definition, does that have to be a high standard or a low standard? You get it, right? Any standard that you're going to force every kid to is going to require to be a fair standard, an accessible one. It has to be a lower standard, not a higher standard. We've had outcome-based education like this for 40 years. This isn't new. It's failed every time it's been tried. The only thing, we know for a fact, the only thing that really guarantees a good education are three things. You need a committed mom and dad, a disciplined child, and an effective teacher. Studies show, and I'll show you some in a moment, every step away from that you get. The more from take, when we took, America became a superpower on the backs of men and women who learned in one-room schoolhouses. And then in the 1980s, right, it all got kicked up from the classroom to the districts. Then a little bit later, in the 90s, from the districts to the states, officially. And then, with no child left behind, the federal government, and now Common Core. The farther you get away from allowing control to take place between the little triad there, the worse education becomes. And that, I'll prove that to you momentarily as well. Every study we have shows that. Common Core is as far removed from allowing teachers, moms and dads and kids to impact in, uh, education as you can possibly get unless someday the United Nations was to take over education. And I got to tell you, you may scoff at that, but look it up online. In 2004, you can find it online, Bill Gates signed a mutual agreement pact with the United Nations as a private citizen to begin impacting American education in the name of global interest. You find it online. Two clicks of a mouse, you'll find it. All right, this creativity thing, I mean, just think about it. you got a national curriculum <clears throat> in which they say Common Core is testing, okay? And, and it is testing. But what teacher is not going to teach to the test and the material that's on the test? And, and what's on the test dictates the material that's being taught to the kids. You cannot avoid that, and you're going to hear that later on here. But just think of this. You, you can't have one curriculum being taught to every student and have creativity. 
and you can't meet the needs of the student. You're going to dumb down everybody to the same level. Instead of producing creativity and innovation and understanding where the child is and letting them excel and move ahead and, and uh, taking other ones and adding material so that they understand it better than what they already have, it's terrible. Um, that's Dr. Duke Pesta, P-E-S-T-A, and you can go online and research him, but this is the first time he's made a presentation that deals specifically with all of the so-called socialist Democrat people and what they're saying about Common Core. So these are Democrats that saying Common Core is bad. These are communists, socialists, <clears throat> uh, people that you would think would want a national curriculum. But we're going to find out why one of the reasons they're against Common Core, which I think is very interesting. So uh, let's, let's uh, again, the big things about how well a child does with education, parents, teachers, and a disciplined child. And, of course, what you've heard here down in the St. Paul Public Schools, if you've seen Bob Zick's show, Inside Insight, and what he's been talking about public schools, the parents are saying, these kids are not disciplined. They're running wild in the school, and it's got to stop. And, of course, the school is just kind of, school board is kind of, okay, you know, what are they doing? You know, it's really bad. Okay. So, and I, I, we've heard it from the legislators in this area, from Senator Wigger, from um, Peter Fisher. It, they, they tell you it, it's not the curriculum. It's the testing, okay? And it just doesn't make sense. Um, doesn't work that way in real life. And real life matters. And that's the issue that came up in the family law that... The, the laws that were passed had an effect that was devastating. They were warned about it, but they didn't care because it was about the money. I will explain that later. Okay, let's see the next clip. What's, what's changed? It uh, wasn't done. They should be in the hands of those people who understand the context and interests of their students. And, quote, the education of children should be grounded in developmentally appropriate practice. Yeah, that's Chicago telling you. The standards are not appropriate. It asks little kids to do things they cognitively can't do. It inserts things like really graphic sexuality into the curriculum via the textbooks and the pedagogy at remarkably young ages, which we shall see. There's all sorts of, deve and keep in mind, you got a problem with that, you take it up with Karen Lewis. The first person who used the word developmentally inappropriate is the whole Chicago's Teachers Union. How about this? Common Core standards were developed by non-practitioners, non-educators, including, who did it? Test and curriculum publishers. That's who did it. Think about this. And you tell me if I'm wrong. Nothing has changed in math in a thousand years for kids from kindergarten to high school. Have we invented a new geometric shape I am unaware of? Did somebody insert a new number into the system? For kids in fi five years old to, 20, to 18 years old, nothing has changed mathematically. You ought to be able to buy one textbook and keep it for 50 years. But the problem is, companies like Pearson, they don't make any money off that, do they? Have you noticed since the 1970s, have you noticed that every three or four years now we throw everything over and out and start over again? That's by design because they got to keep selling you stuff to keep making money. Do you know who the second largest donor to Common Core is outside Bill Gates? Pearson Publishing. Pearson Publishing. Did you know that your federal government gave Pearson the exclusive contract to produce, manufacture, and grade the exams? Every test your kids take, Pearson gets $30 a head. What's 30 times 60 million? And by the way, the federal government did not do an open bid contract. They just handed that arrangement to Pearson. So Pearson has 100% of the can Canadian market and has a very significant percentage of the United States market, and now they get this blank, you know, here's the contract, we're giving it to you, no open bidding for this testing. And, of course, if you understand uh, the uh, philosophy of why you do that is because you want to control every aspect, so you control who you give it to, uh, you're going to understand this is a, a severely about limiting your liberties. 
Um, so yeah, what's changed with math? Well, why did Common Core come in and change the math? What they're doing in over-sexualizing your children is unbelievable. And I'm not going to show you. If I showed you, if I showed this uh, material to a minor, I, I'd be arrested for child pornography. Or if I showed it to an, another adult, I'd be arrested for child pornography. You know, but here they want to teach it right to your children. Folks, you got to get your kids out of the schools. Who's doing it? Who's doing Common Core in Minnesota? St. Paul Public Schools, White Bear Lake Schools, 622, North St. Paul, Maplewood, you know, North St. Paul, Tartan. They're doing the Common Core. And it's because of funding. And if you heard the funding, Bill Gates, oh, he's a philanthropist. That's right. Just understand this. Bill Gates, man, he doesn't do anything bad. He's a big philanthropist. So let's, uh, you know, how could he do anything bad? Oh, and Pearson book, they publish books, you know, for educational purpose. What could be bad about them? Well, Bill Gates, in order to implement Common Core, 70% of the computers in the schools would have to be uh, upgraded. 70%. He will make a lot of money. So you see this, uh, this corporate Democrats are pushing and encouraging the rhinos like Jeb Bush and Chris Christie and even Scott Walker is kind of hemming and hawing here, but is kind of on with Common Core because they're offering them money. It's coming, that's why they get involved with it. And, but it's not coming from the government, it's coming from the corporations. Well, it, it's worse than that. Um, but let's see the next clip here on, you know, who pays for this. How about this? I mentioned to you before, right? Who pays for all of this? You think, Minnesota, you think states like Wisconsin, you think states like New York that took money from the Race to the Top program? They're giving you money so we took the standards. Do you honestly believe the federal government's going to keep giving you that money in perpetuity? They're going to give it to you just as long as it takes to get you completely switched over. Then guess who's going to pay for it? I'll give example one. Notice the date. January 29th of this year, about a week ago, right? In the news, California, districts seek reimbursement for Common Core test costs. The state of California could be liable for as much as $1 billion per year in costs if a group of school districts in California succeeds in winning reimbursement for expenses associated with the implementation of the computer-based tests. Already, the school districts in California are suing the state to pay for the tests up to about a billion dollars a year the people of California are going to have to pay to simply be able to afford. You think that makes up for the 800? They got $800 million, California, one time. And now you're talking a billion a year just to keep up with the testing, right? All right. Well, that's, uh, you're going to end up paying for it, and it's going to be another federal government will give you money and will take it away and but you still got to do the testing and then that's going to come out of your pocket all right let's find out about who designed this program and what he has to say about the program itself so let's let's go here this the man singularly responsible for these tests the man singularly responsible for Common Core, the architect of Common Core, the man paid by Gates to hold, to put the committee together. To, oh, he's called the architect of Common Core. His name is David Coleman, C-O-L-E-M-A-N. The Huffington Post calls him the most powerful educational administrator you've never heard of. Keep in mind that David Coleman has never in his life been a classroom teacher. He's the guy that was appointed to oversee this. And get this, no sooner did David Coleman oversee the writing of the Common Core Standards than he immediately left Common Core and miraculously, he became the CEO of the college boards where the same man who wrote Common Core is now rewriting the SATs and the ACTs, you know, the exams your kids are going to have to take to get into college to conform to his standards. How does that happen? You don't even know who he is. He's never been elected to anything. He goes from being the chair of the architect of Common Core to now conveniently the man who determines what your SATs are going to look like for your kids. And you think about this if you're, not, if you're homeschooling your kids. 
You think about this if you've got your kids in Common Core free private schools. Soon, they're going to have to start taking ACTs that are geared exclusively to the Common Core standards. That's by design, right? You see what I mean by takeover? Here's David Coleman. And how many of you have heard this, right? The, uh, what we just said, our teachers have freedom, our teachers have latitude, we've got local control. I want you to listen to David Coleman. Here's what he said. Which is teachers will teach towards the test. There is no force strong enough on this earth to prevent that. There's no amount of hand waving. There's no amount of saying they teach the standards, not the test. We don't do that here. Whatever. There you heard it. Teachers will teach towards the test. You have to as a teacher. You want your kids to be successful with testing, and if testing is the measure of their success, you got to teach towards it, towards the material that's going to be covered in that test. So this is a, uh, um, <laughs> it's a severe problem. This is a guy that doesn't, never been in a classroom, taught it in a classroom. So um, let's go. Washington State uh, did the Common Core issue. Now they're rejecting it. Let's show the next clip. the crony capitalism, right? Oh, by the way, people ask, well, Bill Gates, he's such a philanthropist. He does all this for nothing. Excuse me. It has been estimated that 70% of American school districts, 70, will have to upgrade their technology to be able to do the kind of exclusively computer-based computer tests Common Core mandates. Whose computers do you think are going in those schools? Do you think Apple got that contract? Right. And ask yourself, look, if this had been the Koch brothers, would it not be on the front page of the New York Times, right? Rogue billion, if it were the Koch brothers, Harry Reid's head would explode all over the Senate floor. <laughs> so I simply ask, and he would be right to be upset. Why aren't we? Why, why are we? Why are we? This is the thing that gets me. It is so obvious they told you what they're doing. I'll show you that too. How about this? Did you know that one week ago, the Democrat Party, the entire state Democrat Party in Washington State, a much more progressive state even than Minnesota, they voted unanimously to remove Common Core. The Democrat Party did. Here's what they said. The Central Committee of the Wash... And notice the date. This is January 24th of this year, 2015. The Central Committee of the Washington State Democratic Party has passed a resolution roundly condemning the Common Core standards. This is the first time a statewide Democratic Party committee has taken a public position against the standards. And it happened in the backyard of the Gates Foundation, which has provided the funding that made the national standards possible. This could signal a sea change for the beleaguered standards because up until now, political opposition has been strongest in the Republican Party. Yeah, <clears throat> so even the Democrats are figuring out what's going on. We're not going to play the, the last clip because Washington uh, State uh, had passed a resolution to totally get rid of Common Core. Uh, and so they're, it's on the way out in Washington State, Gates <laughs> backyard. Um, but here, understand this. You hear the architect of Common Core confirming this is about the curriculum uh, because it has to be, because you can't avoid it. And so if we structure our tests the way we want them to be, we force the curriculum on the teachers in order for those teachers to be successful, okay, because their kids need to pass the test. So um, even though Senator Wigger says it's not about the testing, it is, and it's not about, it's, it's about the testing, not about the curriculum. Who's he listening to? He's not listening to the person who designed the program and is designing the testing in order to drive the curriculum. You heard it from the guy himself. So this is a problem. Senator Wigger needs to figure it out, or he has, and he's not being honest with you. You know, my opinion, he's figured it out. I don't think... Senator Wigger is a stupid guy. I think he's very smart. He's very powerful, very in intentional in what he does. And uh, he's good at getting people money. 
whether they deserve it or not. So, all right, that's Common Core, and you can go to mncd4conservative.com, and you'll be able to see um, this whole video of this whole presentation, not right now, but in a couple of days, you know, so, you know, maybe February 14th, maybe next Monday, who knows. Uh, but it'll eventually uh, be up because you need to, you need to see this. Okay, uh, two bills in the House, family bills. Uh, I want to show you, uh, first of all, House File 512, which what it does is modifying the computation of child support obligations, modifying parenting time expense adjustments, amending the statutes. Uh, I want to say this to begin with, and I don't have the Representative uh, Norton, well, Representative Norton did this, but this is a process of two years that's gone through on 20 groups of people, negative, positive, 10 negative, 10 positive, for the presumption of joint physical custody. This is all about to be about the presumption of joint physical custody, and the other side against presumption brought in all the money. We've been accused who's in favor of presumption of joint physical custody have been presume to be only about the money. And in this case, we've, I mean, for years we said, no, it's about time with your kids. And so when Dayton said, vetoed a bill two years ago that changed one word from a 25% presumption to 35% presumption, he said, okay, there's something going on here. I need to know more about it. You 20 groups get together, work it out, whatever you come up with, we're gonna, we're gonna nail it down. Uh, so, uh, the, the, the first video here is, is explaining, well this, I've never seen this before. This is a man who started a father's rights group here out of Mankato, Minnesota. Um, there's never been a father's rights group that has testified down at the legislature. There's been those that have been accused of being father's rights groups, but they weren't father's rights groups. And here's this uh, uh, Mr. Smith explaining why he's in favor of, of this bill, but gives a little background too. So let's hear what he has to say. I'm with the Father's Rights Movement of Minnesota. We are a grassroots organization that focuses on shared parenting. So a child can grow up and thrive after separation and divorce. We are the largest shared parenting organization in Minnesota. And we've also become one of the largest shared parenting groups in any state. This speaks volumes about the laws currently on the books here in Minnesota. Um, we are the Father's Rights Movement of Minnesota. 44% of our support is women. It's stepmothers, mothers, grandmothers, sisters, aunts, cousins, you name it. Um, our goal originally was to change the current laws of Minnesota and allow them, allow children to be able to maximize their time with the parents. And in doing so, we realized we've also become the largest community support group for non-custodial parents in this. I think this bill, HF 512, is a good bill. It provides fairness in regards to child support. Um, there are a few issues with it that I think should be addressed in the future. Uh, one of those is in area 313. The percentage of parenting time may be determined by calculating the number of overnights that the child court order to spend with that parent average over a two year period or by using a method other than overnights if the parent has a significant time period on separate days. This is also included in the percent calculations uh, as the header of overnights or overnight equivalents. And I think it must be addressed what exactly is an overnight equivalent. I'll just share my story briefly. Over many years, I have ended up with 44% parenting time, never allowed to go above that, strictly because it would be a great loss of income for my child's mother. Not only do I have 44% parenting time based on overnight stays, I also take care of my daughter four days a week, June, July, and August. 
add that up, eight hours a day, it's 416 hours in a year and 17 days if you divide it by 24. That's a way to calculate it. But over the years, I have yet to find a judge that will see that time as a significant amount of time. It seems very easy to just add up what overnight stays are and figure it out from there. But I will say this bill is a huge bill. This is awesome. This provides fairness for every parent. And like they said before, that it will decrease the amount of arguing amongst parents of who gets what time because it's fair. It's day for day support of that child. I appreciate you letting me be up here. Thank you very much. Yeah, and, and I agree with those comments that he made. Um, the next person up, um, uh, John Kerr, has been to the appellate court three times, and he addresses this issue of the fall off. In, in other words, you had to have 45.1% parenting time in order to equal out your child support payments. And so he's going to tell his story. And, and when the income shares was pushed by Representative Steve Smith and Senator, at that time, State Senator Tom Neville, who's now a judge, um, uh, they, they pushed this and they put in this, you know, either you got, I think it was 15% parenting time, uh, and what, if you're above that, then you would get a deduction for child support but you wouldn't get one, another one, until you're over 45. And their argument was, well, people will be fighting over the time they have with their kids. And what, what is happening is um, these things end up being weapons, these barriers, these barriers, not barriers, but uh, boundaries that are established. Uh, they end up being used as a tool to, okay, I, I'll give you a lot of time uh, but I'm not going to lose any money. So I'll give you 44.9% of time with your children, um, and, but now I get to collect you know, $1,000 a month in child support versus $100 a month if I give you another tenth of a percent time. You know, that's the type of thing that was going on in, in the courts, and, and it's financially devastating. So let's hear what John Kerr has to say. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity here. I've, I've, I've been asking for this type of a bill for several years now. I was divorced in 2008, um, shortly after this new statute um, came. I think it was it started in 2008. Um, I, I think I'm the textbook example of, of what's wrong with the current law as it is today. Um, to give you a little background on my situation, um, our parenting time is essentially equal. We share an equal number of days in a two-week period. Uh, mom has Monday, Tuesday. I have Wednesday, Thursday. We go, the kids go back Friday, Saturday, and Sunday between both homes, so that's completely equal. The only exception is, is that on my Sunday nights, they go back to mom at 5 p.m. So what that did was essentially put me below that 45.1% parenting time. I'm sitting at 43.4% parenting time. So when this all came out, and of course this is all new, and you know, as you're getting divorced, you're not, you don't know what's going on. And the difference between, in my case, between being above 45.1% parenting time and being below 45% parenting time was I either paid $1,141 per month in child support or $81 per month in child support. It was a difference of almost $1,000 a month. So it's been that way ever since. And I mean, I got divorced when my children were two and three. Um, so it equates to about $200,000, you know, over the course of my children's lifetime. Just because I don't have my kids on, you know, two days a month, two Sundays a month from 5 p.m. to overnight. So I'm very happy that I see this. And I kind of echo my concerns about line 313 as well as the last gentleman did. Um, in my case, I actually went to the Court of Appeals on, some of the, on this very line, and I basically asked the Court of Appeals to calculate it in another method other than overnight because I have significant parenting time on this Sunday, and it makes <coughs> such a big difference. And the uh, Court of Appeals said 
the word may is permissive, which allows the judge to do whatever they want to do with that entire sentence. And because there's a comma which explains, you know, it may be, it, the judge is basically given the opportunity. If they feel they want to calculate it that way, they can do some other method, but it's up to the judge. The word, the word may is permissive. The word shall would be authoritative and say that you must consider that. So that would be my only complaint. But on the hindsight, you know, if you do this gradual slope, this really doesn't matter that much anymore. Because if we had this in place when my divorce took place, I mean, it we would have been talking a difference of $81 a month or $150 a month. And we wouldn't have gone back to court. We've been to the Court of Appeals three times over our case. Um, it's completely destroyed our relationship. It's just awful. So I really encourage you to pass this. Um, and again, I've been, wait I've been asking for this for several years now, and I'm very happy to finally see this come forward. Uh, very well said. So, I mean, what this bill does, it, it gives better uh, language, more clear language. And the section they're talking about is dealing with a judge's court order that says you get this amount of time and so uh, they, the, the bill also establishes different thresholds, a multitude of thresholds, a lot of thresholds, depending, you know, so when you're going in, you don't know what you're, you know, you say, okay, this is the pairing time, this is what's going to be, this is the court order, so you're going to base your child support on that court ordered time and how much time you have with your children. Well, then reality sets in. Somebody may be saying getting the certain amount of time just because they want the kids so they get the court order, but in reality, uh, they may never see the child again. So this provides an opportunity to go back in and then what was reality? And then you just adjust your child support based on the actual time that you spent with the child. So I really like this. Um, it, it handcuffs the judges more. But on the other hand, it helps them make a better decision and takes away a lot of the political nature of a divorce that goes into play. There will still be political nature because of the domestic violence industry and how they want this to be handled. Um, I think it's going to give rise to more accusations of domestic violence uh, against uh, the mother. Uh, and that will give, that makes all these laws meaningless. Okay, and a whole different set of scenarios comes into play. But you know what? That's okay because then now we can deal with this domestic violence, false reporting, and we're going to see uh, that take shape uh, with this bill. But I think people would rather go through that and, and be able to finally deal with domestic violence. And that comes up in another bill here, uh, 465. House File 465, which deals with custody and parenting time also, but it's modifying the best interest standard, making te technical changes to the law. Um, and so in redefining the best interest of the child and putting presumptions into the language, that really makes this a, a better bill. Not perfect, but a better bill. So let's start with the, uh, this is uh, uh, Jason Smith again. Uh, for Minnesota, Min, mnfathersforkids.com and hear what he has to say about this bill. Sure, my name is Jason Smith. I'm with the Fathers' Rights Movement in Minnesota. Um, most important issue that we take on is for our children, uh, the children of Minnesota and across the nation. Uh, parental alienation and denying parenting time is child abuse. For example, children from father-deprived homes are more likely to have academic issues, early sexual relationships, increase in teen suicide, and a higher rate of committing abuse, just to name a few. Uh, shared parenting reduces family conflict. However, the current custody laws support conflict and some in the family law profession use this for their financial benefit. Um, we realize historically that it has been the father that must argue the right to parent 
normally, especially unmarried parents where the mother is presumed to have full legal and physical custody. However, we have become a place for non, all non-consodial family members to speak and seek and help and guidance. Uh, with, directly with regards to HF 465, um, it's line number 1.13 and 3.10. It's the, del the deletion of the best wishes of the party or parties as to custody. Um, we ask you, the lawmakers, to continue to recognize and respect and protect the fundamental rights of parents to be able to parent even after separation or divorce without governmental control, so long as it does not fall under the child abuse or neglect. Um, will you continue to do this? Yes, yeah, a very good question uh, there. And um, that, that deals with the domestic violence issues, that deals with the attitude of the courts. Uh, and here, taking away parentals, I want this, you know, here's, here's my say. And it's, it's a good question as to why it looks as if parental rights are taken away in this and parental say. Um, so he asked the question and then uh, Mr. Ditburner from the uh, Minnesota uh, family law section, uh, there's a certain section that he deals with, um, State Bar Association, family law section. Uh, he comes up and answer it, and I'm going to point out a couple things that he says. We're running out of time here, but let's hear what he has to say in answer to this question. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, um, with regard to the issue of the deletion of the factor that's known as the wishes of the parties, um, we took a hard look at that, and we looked at what experiences were under current law. This came from the Uniform Marriage and Divorce Act, that language. Uh, which Minnesota was just a handful of states that adopted that. Um, and what we found was that that wasn't really meaningfully being used by courts in analyzing the best interests of the child. Uh, courts were basically saying, well, this parent wants this type of custody arrangement. That parent wants that kind of a custody arrangement. And that was the limit of the analysis that was being conducted using that factor. And so what we thought was, what, we, what can we do to make it more meaningful in terms of enhancing parent-child relationships? And so you'll see that there's certain factors in here that really do take into consideration what wishes are, such as uh, on line 4.23, the willingness of each parent to provide ongoing care for the child. Um, line 9, uh, uh, or line 4.28, uh, factor 9, the effect of the proposed arrangements. It's parties that are proposing certain types of arrangements. And so in that, uh, the wishes of the parties are going to be given consideration. Also, too, if you look at in terms of promoting parent-child relationships, uh, in uh, lines 518 or 511 uh, through 513 on page 5, um, taking a look at uh, considering that uh, it's in the best interest of the child to promote the child's healthy growth and development through safe, safe stable, nurturing relationships between a child and both parents. And line 514 to 5.16, uh, the court shall consider both parents of having the capacity to develop and sustain nurturing relationships with their children, unless there are substantial reasons to believe otherwise. So really, you know, I believe fundamentally that uh, parents have a constitutional right to the care custody of their children. And judges in this state are under an oath to honor that constitutional right. <coughs> And so what we decided to do here was not to eliminate what people want to do, but to have a more sophisticated analysis that judges were going to give greater credence to. And I think that we've accomplished that. All right. Very good. I think he answered it very well uh, and made the key point here under 5.14 of the bill, House File 465. The court shall consider both parents as having the capacity to develop, to develop and sustain nurturing relationships with their children. That's huge. That is, that is super, super huge in this equation. And that really, see these things are reworded uh, 
to from these hard statements of um, the court shall consider the parents each parent's wishes to a presumption that the parents are acting in the best interest of the child and putting it in 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 the law there and um, putting the onus on the judge to say why a child shouldn't have time with their parent so it's a it's a big big deal a couple comments though <laughs> that I had to take issue with with um, Mr. Dipburner is that says judges are under an oath well we know Carolyn Lennon wasn't under an oath for three years and she went out and really uh, hurt some people uh, and then when she was called to account she then signed her oath of office three years later in the executive branch of government, the governor, the attorney general, and the judicial branch has ignored this issue, and now the legislature is taking a look at what's going on here. Uh, so uh, judges are on an oath. Yeah, they have to follow the Constitution. No, they don't. We just had the Supreme Court decision on uh, DUIs, where two of the justices says you're ignoring the Supreme Court. So with that, you know, so do they? All right, this is better. Hey, thanks for watching. Uh, we'll be back here next week, uh, follow up on some of these issues, what's going on down at the legislature. Remember, uh, if you don't stand up for other people's liberties, who's going to stand up for yours? And good men don't do nothing. God bless. Have a great week. You're long gone the Days go by The forest sets on fire